Oh, there we go. <coughs> hmm. Okay, well, I guess I'm... Hi, Matt. <laughs> Welcome to the chat room. <laughs> um, all right, so I guess I should get started because it is six o'clock. Uh, this is the <clears throat> uh, new DMs workshop that I have put together um, for newbie DMs and hopefully folks will uh, will come on in. Um, yeah, and if it's just me and Matt, then that's that's fine too. <sighs> okay. Uh, uh, so, it's gonna be fun because Matt, I know is an experienced GM. But hopefully, hopefully you can ask questions that um, that newbies would probably ask too. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Eric has also joined us. This is great. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get started. Um, oh, cool. Okay, so Matt, this is this is at least something will be new. So I'm going to get started because this is being recorded. So if anybody is watching the recording, uh, hi, and um, I hope that this is informative for you. <clears throat> um, the topic of today's workshop is prepping a module and uh, setting it up in Roll20. So the first half of this is, uh, is to prep the module. Um, and prepping as a GM can mean a lot of things. Um, and probably the first thing that it means, though, is uh, get to know your module. Uh, so I'm going to walk through a little bit uh, a typical D&D module. Now, this one that I'm using is Treasure of the Bo Broken Horde by Sean Merwin. Um, it's a uh, it's one of the uh, like mini series adventures uh, that were published um, back in season five, which was Storm King's Thunder. Um, so, and you can see just from the beginning of this of this page, which um, if I expand it too much, I won't be able to read the, see the chat room. So I'm just gonna. Uh, I hope this is legible. Um, but basically, uh, just from the first page, you already know uh, sort of the background. A famous relic hunter seeks adventures to help her find caches of treasure hidden by the now defeated followers of the cult of the dragon. Um, <clears throat> And the important thing that you're looking for is the five one-hour mini adventures for first and second level characters. So the first thing that you'll know is that this is going to have uh, short adventures for very low level characters. So uh, it's not even tier all of tier one, it's just first and second. It's a really good intro uh, to the system. It's great for when you've got uh, like a weeknight at the game store and you've got new players, that kind of thing. The adventure code is also something you'll wanna know. Uh, it's DDAL0501. Typically um, with almost every season, They've put out at least one, Adventures League has put out at least one DDAL uh, season number dash zero one that is one of these five mini adventure uh, modules. So, which is great that, that, you know, no matter what season you're running, if you're running Curse of Strahd, there's one for that. I, th I think there's one for season three. Um, if, if you're running the very first season of Adventures League, there's one for Tyranny of, of Dragons. So there's, there's, Typically, there's at least one. Um, and ah, Matt has a great a great question. Uh, how are these modules accessible? This module is accessible on dmsguild.com. And it, you do have to pay for it. I think it's five bucks. Uh, it's not too bad. Um, but of course, once you've bought it, you can run it a thousand times. Uh, and so that's, 
that's something that you've got available. They are not free on Roll20. In fact, they are not sold on Roll20, which is one of the reasons why part of this will be how would you convert this into a Roll20 module or how would you set it up to play it online? <clears throat> um, there are modules that are available on Roll20. Uh, some of them are free. Uh, the official D&D ones from Wizards of the Coast are not free. They do have a cost, um, but you can get uh, like the whole Tyranny of Dragons storyline, Horde of the Dragon Queen. Um, uh, you can get Curse of Strahd. You can get uh, Storm King's Thunder, Tomb of Annihilation, um, Princes of the Apocalypse, uh, and we are taking pre-orders for we, they. Um, <laughs> I'm not officially representing World 20 tonight, so I got to be clear about that. Um, they're taking pre-orders for the Water Deep season, which starts with Dragon Heist, uh, that should be available on uh, September 7th. So that is coming up. I'm kind of experienced. Ex I'm kind of excited about it. So, um, <clears throat> and Eric says that. Uh, that the modules are worth the cost almost all of the time. Yeah, they're, you know, it's the, these mini adventure modules are definitely worth the cost, uh, in my experience. Um, the ones that, th like the, the individual modules that are standalone, some, some people, like some of them aren't as, as great as others. Uh, I would just read the reviews because f thankfully, because of the popularity of D&D &D and the popularity of Adventures League, all of the Adventures League modules have a lot of uh, reviews available. So y you can usually get a lot of insight into that. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So that was our first page. Um, and then th my, my advice for everybody uh, starting out as a GM, especially for Adventures League, um, is read pages one through five of the module really carefully once, because pages one through five are pretty much the same for every module that you will encounter. Um, but this one, so this one t gives you like a, a basic overview of this this module, it tells you the name of it, it tells you it's optimized, or it's designed for three to seven first to second level characters, and it's optimized for five first level characters. So, so in the very first page, one of the first, our first page of text, one of the things you're going to look for is what is it optimized for? Because you will be looking at, there will be places in the module that tell you if you have a weak party, do this, if you have a strong party, do that, and we'll get into uh, how do you know if it's a weak or a strong party? Um, because there's guidelines for that in this first five pages. Okay, um, but the rest of this is mostly is mostly a template, a boilerplate that they use for nearly every Adventures League module like this. So there's an introduction to the Adventures League. There's information about how to prep the adventure. So um, in a paragraph, they give you as much information as I'm going to give you tonight. Ha ha ha. Uh, <laughs> definitely read through that, though. Um, always, always read this at least once. Um, uh, you know, in your life, because uh, you really get to know it. This is good advice and it's good to have the knowledge. Um, one of the things that that it talks about is Adventures League. If you're playing this at home, it's maybe not as important, but if you're playing it in organized play, you will want to familiarize yourself with the organized play uh, rules and FAQ. Um, those are available at dndadventuresleague.org, I think is the, is the extent, is the top level domain. Um, and they're, they just published the season eight ones. So there's been a lot of changes. There's a lot of discussion about the changes. Um, I'm not actually going to get into th those changes tonight, but um, there might, I might, if this, if this ends up being useful to people, I might make a, make another post later uh, next week or something with, or another stream later with, uh, with those changes and going over them and how to convert um, between what you've got now and what you'll need for next season. Um, okay, so uh, they do give advice that you get the character's name, level, race, class, uh, and passive perception, which is the most common passive ability check, and anything notable like backgrounds, traits, etc. I typically have people write this information on a tent card 
at the table, um, or <laughs> since they're going to, if you're going to be running this online, you'll have access to their character sheets and you can just pop it up whenever you need to. Um, most of the time, uh, I don't, I, I mean, it's, I don't actually need that information at, you know, on the Roll20 table because I can just reference their character sheets. Um, <clears throat> but if I'm playing at a physical table, I like to have people write on a note card their character's name, uh, their character class. I actually don't care that much about their level because as long as they're in, uh, yes, uh, Eric says AC is a big help. Yeah, as long as they're in the right tier, I, it doesn't really matter to me what what uh, level they are. Uh, once I know if the party is weak or strong or average, uh, I don't I don't really need to to know. Um, I don't always need their passive perception. I don't always ask them for that. Uh, sometimes I'll either write it down behind the screen or I'll just ask them at the table when there's something that they should be noticing. Because to be perfectly honest, unless you have a party that just doesn't have anybody with wisdom at all, chances are somebody's gonna, gonna get whatever the passive perception clue is. Um, uh, let's see, about the note cards as an online DM, can you explain why this is common practice at in-person cons? Uh, do you mean the tent cards, Eric? That I'm describing? Okay, so I'll give him a second to answer. Um, for me, the the reason I do a tent card, cards posted on the DM screen, oh, the, um, I will I will get into that in a minute. Actually, that's a different part of setup. Um, so I was I was explaining. I have people write it on a tent card, but I don't have them put it on the DM screen. Uh, I have this. I have them put this information on a tent card. They put it in front of them. They so like I was saying, their name, their class. Um, I might include their pa passive perception. I, I might have them put their AC. Uh, that's usually helpful. Um, it, it can be. It can speed up combat. Um, but one of the things I like them to put down is their pronoun. Uh, not everybody plays a, uh, a a gender that they present as, and I I don't want to assume. And I, quite frankly, I you know I all I need is like, do I call you he, she, they, z, whatever? Um, so I ask people to put that on their tent card as well. Um, so that's that's kind of that's kind of information that I have them put, and then I put them have them put it in front of their character, or in front of themselves, so that they so that other players can see their names too, and players can refer to each other by name. This is, I feel like this is an important part of of getting into your role is other people call you by your character's name, not just the DM. Also for me, I'm a little bit face blind, so if I'm just looking at note cards in front of me instead of note cards that are in front of the person who I'm talking to, I will forget that, you know, Ragnar the Barbarian is that player and not that player. Um, it, it can be, that, that can be embarrassing at the table as a DM because it's a little bit like when your teacher forgets your name and you're, you know, halfway through the semester, so, which I have done as a teacher, it's, it is embarrassing. Um, so the, the module continue, the, the boilerplate continues, tells people to have a log sheet, and then it talks about how to adjust the adventure. So, um, so again, it reiterates, it's optimized for a party of five first level characters. So what you do is you take the, uh, total number or total levels of all the characters and divide it by the number of characters. So you're getting the average, um, in round up or down, uh, you know, 0.5 or higher goes up 0.5 or less than 0.5 goes down. Um, and then you've got the average party level. So say for example, I have three characters who are second level and I have two characters that are first. Um, that's a total of eight. And I divide eight by five, um, which somebody with, uh, with math can probably figure out faster than I can, but I will pop up a calculator here. Um, eight divided by five, one point six. All right, so that's gonna that's gonna round up because point six is higher than point five, uh, so that rounds up to two, right? Now I have a and I look at this little determining party strength, and this chart is the same on all of the modules. Five characters APL greater than greater than the the optimized for party of five first level characters. Our APL right now is one, right? 
So I have five characters, the APL is greater than one. So I need to consider this a strong party. Now, sometimes there will be sidebars in this module that say, for a strong party, add this. For a weak party, remove that. So I'm going to be looking at that and adjusting the adventure as I go, okay? All right, um, again, there's guidance for the DM. You're, you can make adjustments to the adventure. Um, don't make it too easy or too difficult uh, and keep your mind on the pacing of the adventure. Um, those are you know, other, other bits of advice for actually running the adventure. Um, there's in instructions for downtime, there's instructions for spell casting. These are all things that, that you don't have to worry about while you're prepping, but you should read these, this information. And then we get to page five, and now we have adventure background, adventure overview, and adventure hook. So as a GM, if I know who I'm playing with, this, this information is fairly, is fairly useful. If I don't know who I'm playing with, uh, it's even more useful. So I'm going to read the adventure background. Um, the cult of the dragons plan to summon Tiamat unraveled. Members of the cult hid the amassed wealth and ca wealth and caches throughout the Sword Coast. Uh, so they, you know, now I'm envisioning. Okay, so we have like these cultists, and they're basically they're basically making off with their with their um, war booty as they're as they've been routed in this in the previous campaign. Um, a a uh, famed treasure hunter has learned of these locations. Um, she's she's you know searching for it. And at this point, I'm going to mention this this workshop has spoilers for this module. So please, if you're planning to play it uh, now, would be a good time to quit uh, listening to this um, to the stream because because I'm about to I'm about to spoil it. Um, all right. So and then and then. You know the the big reveal, of course, is that um, they have killed uh, Verada Stor. The uh, giants and follow and their followers have have killed uh, this uh, this person who found five of these caches. So, meanwhile, uh, the heroes of our party have been uh, hired by Verada Stor, the person who's just been murdered, to find um, uh, to find some of these one of these caches. And the adventure hook starts out with they're going to go meet her, who they who they were hired by, and they get there and they they discover that she's been killed. Um, and we have here box text. Now, here's my thoughts on box text. Uh, many many box text sections are too long. Uh, many of them, if you if you read this out loud, it's going to take you like a minute, uh, and that's a minute where you're reading out loud. It's not, it doesn't sound conversational usually, um, and players tend to tune it out. Uh, because when we read out loud, unless you are a very practiced reader, uh, you tend, your voice tends to get a little more flat, a little more monotone. So paraphrasing is great, um, and this is one of those places where preparation is key. So you're going to read this really carefully. You're going to say, okay, so Verada Store, she's, She's put out a call for adventurers. Okay, that's good to know. You're going to look through it. You're going to say, okay, um, there's signs of goblin presence, but it, their trip was otherwise uneventful. Why is that important? Well, you later read in the rest of the module, it's important because this is foreshadowing that there will be goblins in this adventure. So if you make sure, like, you can even highlight this, okay, does this... That, you know, do I, I need to make sure that this has um, been mentioned when I paraphrase? Uh, because my players should know that they're, you know, they're foreshadowed that there's goblins, right? Um, and then you describe that, oh, there's countless footprints of various sizes, uh, lots of blood stains, uh, countless footprints of various sizes. That's another clue, right? Um, so, yeah. Oh, and that's a, that's a really good point Eric makes in the chat. For Adventures League in particular, um, there are moments where th th these particular, this background uh, moment is when um, players have a little more engagement with, uh, or they can get more engagement with the, uh, the backstory of the adventure. It's a good 
it's a good moment to give them um, some moments for oppor- you know, opportunity for role playing. Uh, like this particular box text says, you know, a search of the area ultimately turns up the body of your would-be employer. Well, you could do that, or you could say, what do you do? And let them say, oh, I'm going to search the body. I'm going to search the area and see if I could find a body. Because then they're engaged. Uh, And it also gives you an opportunity to have, like if they say, oh, well, we're not traveling together. We're all, we're all new. Okay, well then, you know, let's give you guys a reason to to come together to, to search this area or to gather up these notes and so forth. So there's kind of a, like this, this box te- text opens up an, a scene really for you to role play out. Um, so, uh, so that's a, that's a really, it's a really good point. Use this, this background, this, um, uh, the story hook as an opportunity to like, like have the the players um, really explore. So if I'm prepping this module, one of the things that I would do at this point is I would highlight the the clues that are in this particular box text, and I would say, okay, how what is the most interesting way for them to get these clues, and how can I present that information to them? I can just read it, and if you are if you are GMing at a place where you have very limited amount of time, uh, just read it try to be engaging but but you can just you know burn through it because if you're if you're playing with a very limited amount of time and you want to get through you know a, one or more of these mini adventures in that time maybe you do need to rush this part but if you know that you have plenty of time you know it's like oh well I have two hours and I only have to run one of these mini adventures uh, yeah like totally give them give them plenty of time, you know, just to highlight the clues that are important. Um, maybe make a few notes that say, you know, invite them to, to search the area. You might find that they aren't really interested in engaging in this, in which case you may have to be a little creative and come up with other ways for them to get the story hooks into player handout one, uh, which is, uh, these are the, so, so player handout one is in this PDF and it's going to have in it, um, like the the kind of the lead in to each of the mini adventures. So I'm going to jump to that right now. Here it is. Player handout one, Verata stores notes. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Um, so there's there's four main notes um, for uh, for leading to each of those uh, the mini adventures that are in this adventure. So the first cache, it was hidden by the cult of the dragon in an abandoned cave. Um, it was thought to be the smallest of the caches, but it's also not thought to be protected by traps or magic. The second cache is buried beneath a unique structure. The third, and that one is, uh, rent with volcanic area or activity. And it's, uh, uh, it's underneath a pyramid. The third cache is hidden behind a secret entrance in the wall of a green mountain. Um, so, it, like, and and there, and it was hidden by somebody who's an expert in magical curses. So, as you're reading these, and as your players are reading them, they're giving them clues as to what they will encounter when they go on this mini adventure, right? So that first one, it says goblins are known to inhabit it. There's, it's a cave. So they know that it's going to be a cave. There's goblins and there won't be a trap. Um, and might, might have a cave in uh, uh, challenge. Uh, the second cache is a boulder pyramid. Um, there's, uh, it was rent with volcanic activity, making it difficult to navigate. Okay, now we know there might be some skill challenge in there. Um, the third one says that it's behind a secret entrance to the wall of a green sided mountain and somebody was, you know, it might, might have a magical curse. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, the fourth cache is in an abandoned dwarven outpost um, and it was overrun by something terrible and immortal. Okay, that one sounds terrifying and maybe if you're first level you'd say, nope, I'm, I'm not doing that one. Um, or maybe you'd say, this sounds great. I'm a dwarf. Let's go. Uh, the fifth cache is at a tall summit, and uh, it was uh, it's in a shrine that was revered by by giants. Um, 
so and there's a and there's um when the bl- wind is blowing there might be a loud bell so i we don't know what's going on there um and dragons used to perch there so so if i'm if i'm reading this as a player i might be thinking oh maybe there's maybe there's dr- still dragons there or maybe there's like wormlings or eggs or just you know something related to that 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 might be cool too so you you let the players read these notes um, and you give them time to argue about which one of these paths they're going to take. Not all of these modules have multiple choices like this. Um, a lot of them, especially the beginning of the module, will be very linear. Uh, but what they're essentially picking is which of these adventures do they want to go on, rather than uh, <laughs> rather than like like which path. So give them give them a little time to to argue it out. Um, and uh and and sort of figure out what they what they want to do um so then i go back up to uh page five there we go all right and having given them hand handouts uh number one um now you know at this point now so so and i'm still i I'm talking as if I'm running through it, but really what I'm doing is I'm imagining like, okay, so now I give them that choice and they decide which one they're going to go for. Now, as a GM for Treasure of the Broken Horde, I really have to prepare for each of those modules. Um, tonight, I'm only going to prepare one of them <laughs> uh, just for in, in the interest of time and because I'm streaming this, um, we'll just prepare one. But you at home would, of course, want to prepare all five or at least read through them pretty carefully. Um, when I run this, uh, my favorite one of these is mission number one beneath the hills. And the reason I like it is um, it's it's cute <laughs> uh, and and kind of fun. And they get to fight a giant, but the giant has been shrunk down. So it's kind of cool. Um, so so here I am, I'm ready to prep my, the actual, like, getting into the, the mission itself. So I'm going to start reading uh, each of these encounters. Now, in, these, in this template, um, they, they split up the encounters pretty well. Like, they identify them by heading, many small problems is one encounter, and then you go on to the second encounter, which is even more, even smaller problems, and, uh, and, and it's, it's very straightforward. So... Sam so reading this, I'm like, okay, here's my box text. There's a large cavern and it, you know, I can read it kind of describes sort of a, a large cavern with a bunch of rubble and everything. Um, there's a map provided with this module, but a cavern is a cavern. As long as there's a couple of tunnels, um, and one of the tunnels has a bunch of debris in it, I, I'm kind of okay. Like as, as long as, as long as whatever map I'm using has, at least that much information, you know, at least th- those features in it, I'm, I'm good. Um, it tells me in the non-box text that there's four goblins hiding in the debris, so which get half cover. Oh, what's half cover? Okay, well, and I'm pretending I'm a new DM here. I need to know what half cover is. So that means I'm going to look it up in my book, and I learn, oh, half cover means they get uh, plus two to their AC, right? Um, it it, this is this is one of the one of the rare times where fifth edition doesn't use advantage disadvantage. They use it for cover, um, and they get a plus two to their AC. Okay, so so I need to know when I'm when I'm running this adventure, and I might even take my pen if I've printed this out. Uh, I might even take a pen and circle that and put next to it plus two to AC, so that as I'm running it, it's right there in front of me. Um, it tells me that the goblins won't flee, but if the, if there's an exit, like if the, if the exit is clear, uh, and half of them are killed, they will run. So I know that this encounter is not intended to end in, you know, the death of everybody, right? (laughs) Um, the goblins have information. That's cool to know. So I want to, maybe I'll practice a, a voice or two. Hey. I'm a goblin. I've been captured. Oh no. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe practice how, how are they going to, uh, relay the information that, that they might have to relay. Um, and then, uh, they're carrying two vials of alchemist fire. Okay. That's, that's also good to know because when the, 
when the PCs defeat the goblins, I'm going to assume they're going to defeat the goblins. But when they defeat the goblins, that means they they will loot <laughs> two vials of alchemist's fire, and they might use that later in the adventure. So I need to know that that is that is a tool that they will have available uh, later on. All right, and then down here at the bottom of this um, of this page, it says adjusting the encounter. Remember, we talked about APL. I have a strong party. That means I am going to add a goblin. Now, that means I'm going to have five goblins hiding behind the debris. And um, and I look up here and it says, okay, but it says if two are killed, two are going to flee. Okay, I'm going to say if two are killed, the rest will flee, right? Um, I do want to mention up here uh, in that first paragraph, it says, as the adventurers enter the room, anyone with a passive perception of 16 or higher is not surprised by the goblins as they stand and attack. Uh, I would like to point out that at level 1 and 2, getting a 16 passive perception is very difficult uh, in Adventures League because you really can't have a stat that's higher than 16, which means that your base bonus is plus 3 and your proficiency bonus is plus two. It is possible to get a 16, uh, usually by expertise. So if you have a rogue that is that is specializing or is, uh, has expertise in, in perception, they might have it, um, but it's, it's uncommon. So what I would do in this case, because what they're telling me is that the goblins have hidden and their stealth is a 16 or higher, is that if the PCs say, I'm searching, then I'd have them roll perception to see if they see them. Uh, but if they're not really searching or they're not paying a whole lot of attention and, and they don't, nobody has a passive perception of 16, then, you know, like, they, they get surprised. Um, oh, surprised. Wait. That means that's another rule. I should probably know what it is, right? So there's another moment where I'll go and look in the player's handbook and say, okay, how do surprise rules work? And review those and make sure if I need to, I'll write it down next to, uh, uh, next to this passage in the, in the, um, in the, the printout. I, I, oftentimes I'll print out my modules even when I'm running online and, and I'll scribble in the margins a lot because I'm, I, I guess because I'm old and I'm used to like marking up my books when I need to study something. So, um, <laughs> okay. So many small problems is a fairly straightforward, just, you know, goblin ambush type of, uh, scenario. Uh, and then after they finish that and they, uh, have searched the area, they can, um, question prisoners, whatever. And uh, they will see the rubble, uh, they see giant-sized feet, a hell giant um, that got caught in a trap. It tells me that there's, if, the, if they use investigation to search it, um, they'll learn something that it was sabotaged to act as a, as a trap. So it, this wasn't an accident. It was an actual trap. Um, a side note, uh, the rogue in your party, if they have um, per, uh, expertise in... Uh, thieves tools or in um, or if they have proficiency in thieves tools which I think all of them do uh, you should be giving them their thieves tool proficiency on things like investigate when there's a trap um, and 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 sleight of hand when they're trying to um, when they're trying to work with a lock it's something that a lot of DMs overlook but it is something that um, it, it's it's kind of the core of a rogue is being able to deal with traps and locks and, and not having that bonus is kind of lousy. Um, it's also the, that these tools is also used for perception when they're searching for, uh, for traps. And that, again, that's a, that's one of those things where a lot of GMs overlook it. They're like, Oh, your passive is, you know, 10 cause you don't have very much wisdom, but no, 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 they're, they don't have much wisdom, but they may not have much wisdom, but they have specialized in this one thing. So keep that in mind. Um, it's one of those little obscure rules that a lot of a lot of GMs overlook, and it it especially at low levels, like it's kind of hard to play a rogue. Um, uh, I mean, it's not like like tactically challenging. It can just be sort of um, uh, it can be unsatisfying sometimes, uh, and so it's it's nice to give them those moments to shine. 
All right, so when the adventurers are done searching, um, some trouble approaches from the south, and this is where you see a swarm of cursed goblins. So these goblins are tiny, and they're now in swarm form. Uh, what's a swarm? So again, this is one of those places where I could look this up, but fortunately for me, at the end of this adventure, there are stat blocks for each of my uh, each of my monsters, and one of them is a stat block just for the swarm of cursed goblins. Um, so I'm going to take a look at that now. Um, a lot of times I'll bounce back and forth between the the adventure text and the monsters so that I can get in my mind what am I looking at. So over here I'm looking, okay, medium swarm of tiny humanoids. Okay, all right. Uh, they have an armor class of 12. That's a combined armor class. So all of them together, their AC is 12. They have 22 hit points together. You could think of that as there are 22 of them in the swarm and each one has one hit point. All right, they're like they're just a, a glomp of goblins. Um, their movement is 20 feet, but take a look at their resistances and immunities. They they only take half damage from bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, and that's because they're basically it's it's basically a a swarm of multiple creatures. So, like if you're whacking it with a stick, you know you're only going to ha get half of them. Um, their condition immunities they can't be restrained. They can't be restrained because they're they're not one creature. There are 20 of them. Uh, they have dark vision. They have passive perception. And they can occupy another creature's space be and vice versa. Uh, through any open And they can go through any opening large enough for a tiny creature. So they are just this amorphous, you know, it's a swarm. So you got to keep that in mind when you're making, uh, when, you're, when you're running the adventure and think about like, okay, what does that mean? When I ran this one time, the PCs tried to uh, block off the the movement of the swarm um, with like a rock, and I was like, "Oh no, it just oozes right around it," you know. So that was kind of fun because it gave them that opportunity to, you know, be surprised by uh, the swarm behavior. And one of the things that's in, that's that's kind of cool is like you can have the swarm of cursed goblins just represented as a token on uh, on your on your tabletop or or um, or on the on roll 20 but if you do that don't forget that it's a swarm like don't forget that it can just go straight through uh, a tiny crack in the wall um, and and you, you like if you can set that up so that the players you know like oh we're gonna take a defensive position it's like oh no it just slips right through you know um, it won't it won't kill them or anything it's it's a it's a swarm of tiny goblins I mean how how bad can it be? Um, but you know, like you can, you can sort of set, set things up to be kind of fun. Um, the swarm is going to, uh, uh, they give some tactics here in the, in the text. Um, it says that it locks onto the nearest target and assaults it, trying to take it down before moving on to the next target. So this swarm is going to focus fire. It's called, that's when, the monsters all target one creature or one, you know, one of the PCs. Um, they don't, sur it, it tells us that they don't surrender. Um, when they, when they die, uh, the corpses grow back to normal size and create difficult terrain. So, so as the adventure, as the fight, you know, uh, progresses, you're going to be adding difficult terrain to this um, to the map, so keep that in mind. And that means you want to look up difficult terrain rules and make sure you know what that means. Um, and it tells you, uh, you know, a an arcana check can if the if the PCs examine the bodies uh, can tell them about this trap. So again, there's another clue there that um, that that you can give them and it says death or the passage of as little as an hour causes the reduction in size to end. That's an important clue because that puts a ticking time clock on the rest of the adventure. Um, at this point, if they say, okay, well, can we take a long, or take a short rest? A short rest is an hour. If, if they take a short rest, anything else that's in here is not going to be easy to fight, right? Uh, anything else that they encounter is going to be, full size and that's important because the next thing that they're going to encounter is the littlest giant um, again there's notes on how to 
adjust for a strong party. So we have a strong party, add a swarm of cursed goblins. Oh my gosh, my five my five uh, uh, PCs, three of whom are level two, they're going to have to face two of these. Great, good to know. Um, all right, so so now I have in my head, you know, okay, so we got we've got one regular goblin ambush. We've got little tiny swarms. That's that's a little bit weird. That's gonna be fun. Uh, and then we have the littlest giant, and this is a giant that is um, uh, in in the last kind of chamber of this uh, of this cavern. Um, <laughs> it's lit. It's pretty well lit. And you see a creature dressed in ratty furs wielding a cup, club. Excuse me. Um, and then there's a yappy growl that alerts him. A yappy growl? Oh my gosh, what is that? And and that is its pet black bear, which is about the size of a house cat. So um, so she's too small to be a threat. Um, she's wearing a little collar. She, I mean, it's, it's unbelievably adorable. This, this little tiny bear in this, in the middle of this giant fight. Um, and the giant, the hill giant is cursed, uh, which means that instead of being giant, he is small. He's actually smaller than the PCs. Um, and we hop over to his monster stats. Cursed hill giant, small giant, lawful evil. Uh, he has an AC of 13. He has 27 hit points. as not anywhere close to what a hill giant has. A uh, hill giant typically has over 100. Uh, this might be the the one of the few times that the PCs can defeat a hill giant on their own at first level. Um, and he, but he does have two attacks per round, uh, which is great to know because he, since he's by himself, uh, he otherwise, I mean, otherwise he's, he's taking one one attack to again you know to the party for every five that they hit him with that's kind of rough um so like that's a that's a good thing to to be aware of and you want to be aware that if he hits twice so you read this whole multi-attack then the target must make a constitution saving throw or be incapacitated until the end of its next turn so like there's another thing. Okay, then I gotta look up what what was what does incapacitated mean? Um, is there is everything like do I need to know anything to adjust that? Um, and then there's adjusting the encounter, right? So here are the recommendations for adjusting this combat encounter. For a strong or very strong party, give the hurst cursed hill giant fifty four hit points. So when I'm when I'm running this. Uh, I, I look at that. Okay, so he starts out with 27. Wow, I'm pretty much doubling his hit points. Well, all right. You know, the, the, the PCs are pretty strong, so sure. Okay. So, so you know, after, after they fight the giant, um, presumably they defeat him. Uh, he's, he's not someone who's interested in, in, uh, in parlaying. Right, he he's just going to yell uh, that he will tear you apart and feed you to blood drinker. He's not very smart, so he's just going to charge you and or charge your PCs and attack. So, so again, this is you know this is straight straightforward combat. Um, uh, this is another great place where um, uh, PCs, you know, like the PCs who are, have melee and have a lot of like. Like, I'm going to solo this guy. This is a great chance for that, right? Okay, so um, uh, there's not a whole lot to uh, to parlay with Slayer Mighty, the giant. Um, and if they wait too long, he is going to grow to normal size. So uh, encourage them to dispatch with him quickly. Um, <laughs> uh he is carrying a potion of healing, and then if they investigate the chest that he was uh, um, dealing with, uh, there's a stone lid, and there's a note that basically taunts the hill giants, uh, and doesn't like like this. The, apparently, this chest was actually trapped, but the traps went off before the players got or the PCs got there. Um, and then, he, and then here's the cute and sad part: uh, the pet black, black bear, who is also cursed, uh, she calms down, and after however much time you want to have, she begins to convulse and die. Now, 
if your players have hearts, they will try to save her. Um, and if they don't have hearts and you and you still want them to have something cool out of this particular adventure, um, you could remind them that sometimes adventures reward them with pets because Blood Drinker can actually be claimed as a pet in this adventure. So if somebody in the party tries to save her uh, using medicine or arcana, um, she she will live. Uh, it says magical healing alone is insufficient. I, I actually feel like that's... that's I, I kind of dislike that, but I, I sort of understand it. Um, but if you've got like a ranger in the party who's, who's like, no, I really want to save this, this animal, like, you know, let them, let them try. They've got, they've got two rounds when she starts convulsing. So they've got, they've got a couple rounds to try to save her. Um, uh, and hopefully with, you know, several members of the party, somebody can roll above a 10 in wisdom. Um, and then there's a, a way to basically uh, have the bear become your pet. Um, they just have to do a handle animal check. And uh, uh, it says that if more than one character wants the animal and uh, succeeds on the check, um, she will go with whoever has the higher result. Which is kind of cute. Then we've got treasure. We've got our little treasure uh, thing. It tells us what they can loot from this particular part, you know, this particular encounter. Um, I usually skip, skim the treasure section um, in the last encounter because it's going to be repeated later. Uh, so that's where the rewards are. So last page of the of the adventure is going to have the rewards. It'll tell me the experience. So I, I t tally up how much XP they got. Um, that includes if they saved Blood Drinker the bear. That's per character. So if if, if they saved her, uh, everybody gets 25 XP. And then the combat awards, I tally those up and divide. So like, like say there were two swarms and five goblins, so that's 250, 450, 550 XP total, right? Uh, so I'm going to go to my calculator. So 550, and that's divided by five plus 25, and we're going to assume that they did a completely perfect, right? Um, so I got 135, maximum they could get. Well, it turns out there is actually a minimum and maximum for this adventure, which is 75 minimum and 100 maximum. So even if they did everything perfect uh, with with it being leveled up to strong, um, they still, they're still only going to get 100, 100 XP, um, which is fine. They're, you know, this is a, this is like a one-hour adventure, so... Um, that's fine. I will at this point make a caveat that uh, if you are watching this stream or watching this recording uh, after September 1st and you're playing in Adventures League, um, then the XP doesn't it doesn't matter uh, because you'll be using um, experience. Yeah, uh, it's true, Riviac. I probably should have done this after season eight hits, but. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm covering that a little bit right now. Uh, so, so I, I said at the beginning, I'm not really going to cover all of the changes for season eight. Um, but, uh, but you would, they would be earning um, miles, you know, uh, checkpoints rather than XP for this. And the treasure, again, similar to, um, and this is, you know, you still use this for for homebrew, or for a home game. Um, the treasure. It, there's a copper necklace, um, there's the uh, alchemist fire, the potion of healing. So the alchemist fire and the potion of healing are things that um, they, the players have to decide who gets, who gets which, right, Bet amongst themselves. Um, and if they can't decide, then they have to roll to decide or the DM um, uh, uh, can roll. But the gold piece value, the 200 uh, gold copper necklace, that value gets divided up by everybody. So uh, everybody would get 40 gold pieces. And you just pretend that, okay, we just sold it. Um, and then everybody gets five downtime days at the end of this mini adventure. Boom. Like, that's just done. Now, again, season eight, uh, their treasure and checkpoints are determined uh, not by this page, but rather by... Um, how long 
uh, the adventure took or how long it was written for. Um, these are supposed to take about an hour, so I believe that means they would be they would be worth one checkpoint and one treasure point. Um, so that's kind of a again I'm not really getting too much into that, but um, if you if you need to know like if you're if you're running this after September first, uh, two thousand eighteen, you know pay attention to the different to the changes to those to those guidelines. Um, and then again, Blood Drinker the Bear, only one person in the party can claim her. So only one character gets to have Blood Drinker as their story award. Um, and she's not a, a tradable certificate. She's not a magic item. So whoever gets her, keeps her. Um, sh <laughs> and she, what's kind of cute is she can be trained. So like you can, you can train her to do some simple tricks. Like, I don't know, fetch your slippers or something. Um, uh, but she can, she can, ultimately she kind of, kind of turns into your personal little mascot or pet. Um, again, at the, at the end of that, of that section of the adventure, we have the monster statistics. So you've got your goblin, your swarm, and your cursed hill giant. And if you look at each one of, um, oh, and then there's the map. I'll get to that in a second. If you look at each one of these missions, these little mini adventures, they all have the same structure at the end of of the adventure, there's the rewards, there's the uh, monster stats, and then there's the map. Um, so let me go back up to the map. So we've got our map, right, beneath the hills. And I don't have to use this map as long as whatever map I use has these features, which are the caved in, uh, um, oh, that's neat, I can draw on that. Uh, the caved in tunnel, it's got the tunnel that isn't caved in. It's got one large room and it's got one smaller room with a chest in it. Like as long as those features are present, uh, I can pretty much draw this map however I want. Um, but I can also, because it's, uh, because it's a map, um, I can also take a screenshot of it or, or, uh, or copy it out and, uh, and import it into Roll20. So. And that brings me to the second half of the workshop, which is how to set this up in Roll20 to be played. Um, so let's say I want to make this in Roll20. Uh, now, what I have is a PDF. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this PDF and I'm going to copy the image. And then I'm going to open it in my image editing software, which is the GIMP. Uh, come on, come on, GIMP, open up, there we go. And I say file create from clipboard. Uh, which kind of made it a little bit weird. I'm not entirely sure why it does that, but I think when they, um, I think I think when they when they put it in the PDF, they probably did it not quite the right way. But we'll see. We'll try that. That's a little better. In fact, you know what? I think I can transform. Nope. I need the tool. Transform tool. Scale. Uh, that's a lot better. I can watch. I can actually see it while I while I scale it. All right, there we go. Uh, layered it. Oops. Nope. Um, there we go. Fit canvas to layers. Okay, so I've got my map. Um, let me rotate it because otherwise I'll be I'll be frustrated. Rotate it 90 counterclockwise and export it. The GIMP is uh, a GIMP is a, um, uh, a free open source program. Uh, for graphic arts or graphic editing. Uh, it's kind of similar to Photoshop, but it is free, which is kind of nice. Uh, and uh, there we go. And uh, you do have to export it because if you save it, it saves it in its proprietary format. All right, so now let's go over to Roll20. Um, and on Roll20, I have a, uh, a game that I've set up um, and I'm, I'm showing this in my, in my free account. I do have a pro account. Uh, 
that I use um, uh, a lot. <laughs> but um, I know that a lot of new GMs are probably working with a free account, and so I wanted to, I wanted to make this, you know, kind of bare bones. So I named this DDAL0501, which of course, as you may remember from the beginning of this stream, is the name of, or the code for the module. So I'm going to launch the game. Alrighty. Okay, so oh, I should probably move the players over. I'll say here. Okay. And I don't really need the there we go okay so I've got a blank canvas um, and uh, as you can see I actually already made a map on here Shh. Uh, but I'll scroll out and show you guys from the start so here's here's my blank canvas and what I will do is I'm going to open up um, open up my mission map. I'm going to drag that in. Oh, wait, before I do that, I'll make sure that I'm in map and background view. Okay, so this is the DM view, and uh, players don't have this little toggle here because they really only can interact with objects and tokens. So I'm going to drag that in, and it takes a minute to, to upload. Uh, and while it's, uh, when it's uploaded, I'll be able to move it around the canvas. Uh, I'll be able to resize it. And you can see that I've got, so I've got a grid already, right? And the grid does not match at all my grid for this. Like you can see very faint lines on, on the map that I've dragged in. And you can definitely see that the map is way bigger than the grid. So I'm going to increase the uh, width. And I think I'm probably going to need about 50 squares. It looks like it's about 50 wide. So I'll increase it by 50 and see if that is big enough. All right, that's looking a lot better. Now there are um, suggestions in the wiki for, uh, oh. there's suggestions in the wiki for lining up your maps a little better. Uh, but this is, we're gonna, we're just gonna kind of quick and dirty it here. Looks like uh, this map is a little bit taller too, once I've made that, so make that about 40. Okay, great. Okay. And you can see it just, it just, just a little bit doesn't line up still. Um, that's kind of okay. Um, yeah, it's true. It. Uh, mm, the learning curve for running modules in Roll20 is actually pretty slow, pretty low. Um, it, it's, it's higher than it is for playing a game in Roll20. Playing a game in Roll20 is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty quick and easy to get into. But, um, for running a module, like, this is, once you know how to run a module, like, you know, like we, we did the, the, <laughs> yeah, Riviac, you, <laughs> yeah, you, you can, you can count it all the way out. But again, remember, I don't actually need this map, right? I brought this map in because it's already made for me, but if I wanted to, I could just use a plain map and I could say, okay, I have, I'm, I'm on the map layer and I have drawing tools. And I can say, cool, uh, I'll draw this as my cavern. And all that was important was that I have at least one tunnel that's caved in, right? And one tunnel that was not caved in. And that I have uh, at least one, and so I'll just draw a little block there that says that's caved in. Oh, I should make that. There we go. There we go. Like, or, hold on, I do this better, sorry. I'll use the polygon. There. So now it's caved in. It kind of looks like uh, intestines or something, right? Um, 
yeah i i'm not great at drawing either this was all just kind of me you know messing around so um so i know the players the pcs are going to come in over here i actually uh i have this set up with fog of war um and you can see that's enabled here but you could turn that off um if you wanted to it, it's not super important the 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 pcs are gonna you know the players are gonna, are gonna see all of this eventually anyway so it's kind of it's kind of up to you um so and then i can you know select and pan and then i'm going to go to the objects and tokens layer actually what i'm going to do is i'm going to go to the gm layer the reason i'm going to go to the gm layer is because i want to bring in a giant right i'm going to say bring me a giant okay so here is oh i need a hill giant there's a hill giant okay so i have dragged a hill giant and there's his token which actually doesn't have a picture which uh, i think is because he's from the srd the srd doesn't have pictures uh, but that's okay that's all right and the important thing that i need for this guy is that he only has 54 hit points right so i'm going to put that as his token bar and when i've clicked on him um oh you could still see the figures yeah uh that's because i'm on the gm info uh, overlay so when the players are logged in they can't see that um, if you put them on the objects and tokens layer then they can um, so that might be why they could see them uh, and when it's time for them to fight this guy then I just go in here no it, it, was it on the were you on the um, on the GM overlay Riviac Okay, well, it's entirely possible that there was a little bug. Like, uh huh, you had some of the dinosaurs on the GM overlay. It, it, if they're if they did see that, um, it's possible that it was a bug. It's also possible if you were playing with people who were the GM, were logged in as GMs, they would have seen it. Uh, and that can happen if you're sharing module, like if you're sharing the games with other uh, GMs, and like, oh, this person ran it earlier today, and now I'm running it. I know sometimes in organized play we do that. Um, it also will happen if you are running with an admin. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, my account d by default goes to GM. So anytime I play in somebody's game, yeah, that's why. Yep. Uh, that that would be it. Mm -hmm. um, every time I, I, I play in a game, I have to rejoin as a as a player and if you are a gm in a game and you want to rejoin as a player you go under my settings and there's a little button that says rejoin as player um so if you're a dm for for a campaign you can do that so you don't have to you don't get to see everything um so here's here's the here's the thing uh if i don't like this giant i can always search for uh an asset like a token and look there's some free ones oh hey check that out there's a there's a free hill giant so I'm going to use that instead of this guy, right? I'm going to bring him in, and I'm going to make him uh, give him 54 hit points, <laughs> right? There we go. And he's he's tiny, but I I'm just going to have him fill one square. Uh, similarly, I have a bunch of goblins I need, right? Uh, so let's see. I've got an armored goblin, crossbow goblin, or kobold. I'll use an armored goblin. Now remember from my prep, I need four of these guys. You can copy and just tap anywhere and they'll paste in wherever you tap. Right. Now these guys I want them though kinda hiding among the debris, this fake debris that I put in. So I'll kinda tuck them in over there. And the other thing that I need is I need a bunch of these as a swarm. So, oh, I need these to, to not snap. I'll turn off snapping. I'll just dis disable the grid for a minute. So, and the way I'll do that is, okay, I got this guy. I'll shrink him down, and then I will copy and paste him. All right, so now I have a little, a little mini swarm right 
and uh, let's see. And oh look, I can group them. So, oh. so now I can move them around as a uh, like they're a token. So I can put them over here, wherever I want them to be. All right, um, and now let's see if we can find a bear. I mean, tactically, I don't need the bear in there because, you know, she's not a combatant, but she's so cute. So I'm going to put her in there anyway. So put her in there. And then for the final thing, that the final feature we needed was a um, some kind of uh, chest, right? So I can freehand a chest. I can just draw a square if I want. And remember, I mean, all of this, I, I imported a uh, uh, a map, but I don't need to. I could have just as easily just drawn it all out. That's the same color. That's not going to be very clear. There we go. There's a chest. And in fact, if I'm if I'm feeling really cheeky, I can I can even say. Okay, so so there we go. Now, if I look at this as a, as a player, all right, so I've got that all, I mean, that, that took me, what, like 10 minutes to set up that map. Um, it doesn't, you can, you can spend a lot of time setting up a really beautiful map, uh, but you can see the map that they provided, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like, full 3d color or anything uh two two zebra 10 says is it easier to import or or draw it like you're doing now um okay i'm not a very good artist so i would say it's probably easier to import it um but if you're a perfectionist who says i really want everything to snap to the grid um then you probably want to draw it uh because getting them to snap perfectly is tricky um I'd like to point out though that so I have this map and you can see, you only see one grid on this right but I actually have this set up so that there is a grid it's just transparent and the reason I set it up that way was I was like okay uh, if I've got if I've got this blue grid in the background on this map then I like I want people to be able to kind of use that for measurement but what I don't want is to have a grid over it so when I set up this map, I said, okay, here's the color of my grid is transparent. <laughs> um, it's kind of a little cheat, but it works. Um, in this particular case, this particular map, I did have, I do have Fog of War turned on. So when you have Fog of War turned on, as you are playing, uh, you'll want to use the reveal areas tool and you can just kind of, kind of drag. I apparently don't have that selected correctly. There we go. And you can just drag to reveal sections as your players uh, discover them. Um, there's there's dynamic lighting, there's advanced fog of war, there's a lot of extra tools uh, that you can access when you're a uh, like pro user. Um, those are terrific tools. They're amazing. They can look fantastic. Uh, but I deliberately am using a free account to show this off because I feel like uh, a lot of times we're when we're new we're like I don't want to know if I, I don't I don't know if I want to spend ten dollars a month on on this tool this very powerful tool when I don't even know if I like DMing or, or whatever so this is a great way to just sort of get the feel of it without having to you know shell out extra money um, I do encourage people who are DMing a lot to subscribe um, because there are some really valuable tools available um, one of the tools that's available for free is uh, the jukebox so um, this is great I can find a uh, like a goblin cave in here somewhere, right? Um, maybe cave of time. Let me see if this one. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I can add that to my game. Now, when they get into this into this room, I could maybe play it manually. Just uh, click the play button, 
or I can set up a playlist that runs it. Say cave. And I just drag it right in there. Oh. Uh, okay. So here, drag it into. There we go. So now when I play that uh, playlist, that'll play. I can even set it up so when my players are dragged to the right map, it will play when they start, when they get there. So it'll just automatically start playing. It's kind of cool. Um, kind of a, a little, um, a little like, like a little bonus. Uh, some players hate it, and uh, those players will take this um, on the player settings. They actually have a, an option to drop the music volume way down. The DM can do that for the whole game, but individual players can do it as well if it's distracting. Uh, Matt asked, what kind of files do maps need to be? They need to be JPEGs, PNGs. I th think, I don't think we have, I know we don't support animated GIFs. Um, I don't know if you can, I can, I can see if you can drag in a GIF. Um, let me see. Oh yeah, no, that's that's not gonna. Let's see if we can use a GIF. Yes, you can. Uh, so a non-animated GIF would also import. It's hard to see, but there it is. Um, all right. So at this point, I've set up, uh, I've set up my map. I've got that working. It looks all right. Uh, I've set up my, um, I guess not on the other version of my map. Um, oh no, the other other version, the hand drawn version. I set up my monsters. There they are. Uh, when it comes time to play, I make sure that uh, the players are on a, either a blank page. Or a, a you know some some something plain because I don't want them to start out seeing the whole map right. Uh, I might have them start out uh, on like a, a splash screen, or um, I might have had them start out with uh, Verata's notes um, or something like that. Uh, real quick, uh, let me. Uh, Storm King. Oh, wait. DMing workshop. Okay. Um, so I do have two pieces that I that I copied out from uh, from the PDF, and one of them is Verada's notes. Uh, because that handout, I might want to have them have the players be able to see that. So, right. Um, I could include a, a graphic of it. But one of the important things that I need to include is, of course, the text right there. Um, and I can either make that available to all players right now or not. In fact, if I make it not available, um, by default, when I open it, only I can see it. I can click Show to Players. I'll be prompted that I'll, if I show to players, it will, uh, it will be available for everybody. So I can click it, show to everyone. And at this point, if you were a player, this would pop up on screen. If you've ever had your GM pop something up like that, uh, that's, that's how they did it. And I can still edit it if I need to um, or, or not. Um, but that's a, you know, like there's, that's one of the things I would, I would include. The other thing I would include is I have text for Blood Drinker, right? Because remember, Blood Drinker is a uh, is a story award, and I might you know Blood Drinker. And again, I might not make this available. You know, might not show it to players until they have tried. You know, until they've saved Blood Drinker and maybe um, uh, tamed her, and then they could click Show to Players. Um, so that's kind of the the basics. 
Uh, one of the things as a GM in Roll20 that you must do is you are responsible for creating the character page for each of your players. So say I've got, um, say we've got Matt in my game, right? And let's pretend Matt hasn't joined yet. So at this point, I can I can put this in all players' journals. I could make it editable by everybody, or I could make it not editable editable until Matt gets there. Once Matt has logged into my game, then I can select him from this drop down, and then it would be select it would be usable by him. Um, and then there's Character Mancer. Uh, so when you create a character or create a character sheet for the first time. Uh, depending on how you've set up your game, by default it will launch Character Mancer as uh, for first level characters. Uh, if you're playing with new players, it's t it's fine to leave that there. If you if you like don't want them to have to deal with Character Mancer or you don't want them to have access to that, you can say um, discard and exit, um, and and then they'll just have the playing character sheet. They can still launch Character Mancer at any time by going to the settings page and clicking the launch Character Mancer. Um, so there's, you know, they they have some options. Um, personally, having worked on Character Mancer, I love it. It's great. It's fantastic. Uh, but not everybody likes it, <laughs> and that's okay. Um, and uh, and and there you go. Uh, and then you give your players some time to set it up. Um, so that's uh, kind of the the quick and dirty on how to set up a Roll20, you know, a game on Roll20 to, to run it with your players. It's, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of things you can do. You can set up your macros. You can set it up so that, um, you know, you can set up like, like, like individual um, uh, rollable tables and, uh, you know, uh, deck car, uh, car, um, uh, decks of cards if you need them. You can actually, like, set up a deck that's like the deck of many things if you had that in your game and, and somebody can draw it from it. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that, a lot of tools available. But just for, like, hey, I'm just prepping this one module and the one module is, you know, DDAL0501 and I'm, you know, all, all I need to do is get the maps in there. I need to make sure my monsters are in there. Now, you notice that only the goblin in the PDF only the goblin was still standard. Uh, the swarm of goblins and the tiny hill giant, those are those have custom stats. So if I were looking at my hill giant here, this guy's stats are not at all what what uh, what you know the the regular stats. So for him, I need to go in using the little gear icon and change his hit points and change his his um, strength, change change all of this stuff so that it's written for uh, this guy right here, right? So his AC should be 13, and I look over here, and ooh, his AC is hard to find. Oh, there it is up there, 13. Okay, that's all right. His hit points are tw uh, 27, although he's 54, so I got to change that, right? Uh, his speed is not 40 feet, it's 20 feet, right? So I got a bunch of little little stats that I need to change. Now, if I change them for this hill giant, uh, it will not roll back to the, the compendium or anything. Um, <laughs> but uh, like I can rename him if I want to so that if I have other hill giants in my game, I, I know. Um, but yeah, so there's so there's... You know, like like you might have to go in and and shift things around. You probably want to redo his initiative. Although I think, yeah, his his initiative is actually higher uh, as a cursed hill giant than it is as a as a regular hill giant because his dexterity is so low as a regular hill giant. Uh, Two zebra ten says, I think it would be best to first learn the system as a player before trying to run a game over roll twenty. Um, yeah, it's it's good to play. Uh, uh, you know, to start out, if you if you just don't have a group and you have been you know voluntold that you should be the one to run, because um, I know that happens, uh, especially if you're in an area with not a lot of players. Um, actual plays are great, 
like watching other people run games uh you know on on various streams is terrific um podcasts are good uh you can listen to them and you know while you commute or whatever and uh and kind of get get a feel for it just remember that with actual plays and podcasts um a lot of those have become very high production quality uh so you know it's like it's like if you're if you're running or if you're listening to a podcast or watching a stream with like Chris Perkins as the DM and and the other players are all professional actors and voiceover actors, like don't expect your game to go that like that. All right? Like new new DMs that that's that's not that's not typical and that's okay. Uh your players are going to have fun as long as you are, you know, you're, you're looking at it as, hey, you know, we're going to go on an adventure, you've prepared, you know, um, NPC, oh, the, NP like, how to, how to edit the NPCs, um, I, I can go back over that, actually, we have time, uh, and I, I will be happy to do that. Um, so, but yeah, like, just, just as a new, as a new GM, just, like, like, if your players come up with a solution to a problem that is unique and you didn't think of it and you didn't expect that it would go that way, uh, like they're like, no, we're going to talk to the goblins and make friends with them. And okay. Like it's okay to do that. It's, it's okay for them to break the module. It's fun. They have more fun that way. And honestly, you will too. Uh, so, you know, the, the system itself uh, for fifth edition uh, <laughs> when in doubt, use advantage. <laughs> like if something's, if something is a great idea, give them inspiration. If, if they, if, you know, if they do something and you're like, I don't even know what modifiers to apply to that, then, okay, it, it has advantage or it has disadvantage. What, like pick one, um, and, and just, and just roll with it because that, those things work pretty well. I will say if you're running this on roll 20, uh, make a liberal use of the compendium. So that's this little eye icon up here. And say you're like, I don't know what, you know, remember we talked about there's there's a condition called incapacitated, right? So I can search for incapacitated and it will tell me what that means. And it'll tell me specifically what what they can and can't do. So, okay, great, I've got that now. In fact, if I want to keep this up, I can either click this little button and it'll pop up um, or I can just double click it and it'll kind of, it'll collapse down. So it's easy for me to bring it back up. Okay. So can I set up their attack rolls with, uh, for NPCs? Yes. Um, let me show you how to do that. If you're, if you're watching. So right now, uh, multi attack, the giant makes two great club attacks and here are its attacks. Uh, I'm not sure those are right for this character. So I'm going to go over here and look. Yeah, he should only have a plus four to hit, and there's also, he has he has special instructions for his multi attack. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to go over here using the gear icon, and I'll click it, and now I'm going to make changes. So one of the things I'm I'm going to scroll down, right? Uh, he is an NPC. That's important to know. So I'm going to scroll down here and where his. I edit, yeah, I added his attacks by atta right there. So, so there's gear icons next to each of the attacks. Okay. Um, multi attack isn't actually an attack, but it has text that I want to have with it. But the great club is an attack. So it's melee. Yep. Yeah. the The reach on it is only five feet because this guy's tiny. So I'll change that. His to hit is definitely not eight, it's four. So I change that. Still only targets one target. On a hit, uh, it's only gonna do 1d6 plus two. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you to Zebra 10. Um, yeah, I, um, uh, oh, I see, I see. Yeah, no, definitely, um, Riviac, uh, use the NPC sheets, they're so much easier and you don't need all the information that's in another uh, another one. Um, so two zebra ten. I I do run games on roll twenty um, pretty often, and I will probably 
uh, rather than run games for a little bit, I, I might spend the time doing these workshops for a little bit. Uh, just because I think that it's beneficial for uh, for our groups. I know Eric Eric started this group with a bunch of um, people who are new to Adventures League and 5th edition, and I think that's fantastic. But I also think that it's really, really exciting when you go from being a player to being a GM. There's a lot of room for creativity and growth there, and it's a lot of fun. So... Um, Okay, so I fixed my, my great club, and then I just click the little gear icon to save it. Um, I'm going to go up here, and his strength is 14. Uh, his dex is now 10. His con is 12. His int, he's actually smarter now, believe it or not. His wisdom is 10, and his charisma is 8. Okay. Um, great. So I'm going to save that. So there's my tiny hill giant. Um uh, he's not a challenge five. He's a challenge one. So whoop. let me go back in here and change that to one. He's worth, he's actually only worth a hundred XP according to the, to the module, but you know, good to know. Um, all right. So, and then I click the gear icon again. So now I have, I have this hill giant that I can actually, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit more usable. Now, so I've got this guy, right? Hell giant, tiny. And I made a token, right? Or I'm using a token for him, uh, which is over here. This guy. Oh, wrong layer. I want to be on the GM layer. This guy. When I edit him, I can, if I've got it selected, I can click use select token and that'll, that'll make that his token. And then if I double click that token, I can also say this represents a tiny hill giant. And I can show the nameplate and I can even let the players see his nameplate if I want them to. So when we're playing, when I move him to the, to the token layer, whoops, he's not a drawing. Uh, the players would be able to see him now. Um, so that's kind of the the basics. Um, this uh, this guy also had a rock. I didn't fix his rock attack, but you would want to to fix that as well, uh, because obviously it, it should only be four a uh, plus four, and it certainly doesn't do twenty one hit points. Yes, uh, Riviak, there is a toggle. So. And I'm going to show you, I, here, I'll do it this way. Um, add a character. I have this character, right? Save changes. Uh, it's going to tell me to use character mancer. I'm going to say no. <laughs> and I go in under the, the little gear icon. Um, and right here, it says NPC. Boom gets rid of all the player character stuff. Uh, and then I can, I can, you know, edit it as I need to. Now say I'm like, oh, that was a mistake. I don't want it to be an NPC. Down here under general options, click, it's back to being a PC. So super straightforward ways to make it a PC or an NPC. Um, I'm not sure if you set, I know you said that you set up a bunch of your characters as player or your NPCs as player characters. And then, um, and then you've been rolling as, you know, having them whisper. Uh, if you, I don't know for sure, like if you, if you toggle them to be NPCs, I don't know if their attacks will carry over, but it shouldn't be too hard for you to recreate those. Yeah. Um, so, and, and down here where it says, you know, like I've got my, my descriptions and stuff, right. And my actions, my actions will be my attacks and spells. Um, I can add spells to them. Oh, I should see if I can do that. Mm, sleep. Uh, so do you guys know that you can drag, drag and do drop onto, onto stuff? Yeah. Sleep, uh, dragging spells onto NPCs, I guess, isn't quite working yet. Or this one's not set up as a spellcaster. He's not set up as a spellcaster. That's why. Uh, you can set him up as a spellcaster. You can say, oh, he uses 
let's say his phenomenal intelligence for spells and then now he's got spells and it did actually drop drag and drop um okay yeah sure uh removing items matt yes okay um let's look at a character sheet okay um let's say i've added an item i think we're we're now at the q a part so let's uh let's let's do that so let's say we've got an item okay there we go uh we'll say you've got you you got the alchemist fire sure okay um and great i've got it but i used it i want to get rid of it how do i get rid of it stephanie i can add things great no i i need to get rid of how do i get rid of i click the lock icon and it will give me little garbage can icons to delete does that help? <laughs> uh, and in fact, on any repeating section on your character sheet, there's a lock icon. So if you have tools that have been set up, you can click the like, lock icon and delete them. Uh, same thing with spells. Uh, don't have a spell on this. Sleep. Yeah, if you didn't know, you can drag and drop from the compendium onto your character sheet. Um, a lot of things can be dragged and dropped. Uh, but yeah, you click the lock icon and delete. Um, your bio, like that's pretty much free form. That's like just text forms. So uh, the personality traits and ideals, for some reason, they always start out editable and I always collapse them. Uh, class resource right here. Uh, so this is interesting. This character doesn't have a class right now. Um, if I give it a class of like fighter, uh, it will automatically drop the second wind. It will automatically make the hit dice or give it a hit die. It'll automatically give it its saving throws and so forth. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, like you can, now here's the thing, what you, what, what you can't do, or you can do, but it'll it'll mess things up for you. Um, let's see. Turn undead. I'm gonna. Oh, I can't drag that in because that's a higher level thing. Uh, uh, channel divinity. No. Nope. What's another? Yes, you can drag and drop from the compendium. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Somebody give me a, um, a class feature. Let me see if this one works. No, nope, that one doesn't work. Um, packed. You get packed at the beginning, right? No. Nope. Uh, if they're not draggable, you can't drag them in yet. Uh, Turn on dead is a higher level feature, I think. Oh, lay on hands. You get lay on hands at, at first level. Uh, no. Okay. Hmm, interesting. We're we're in the middle of changing how this works, so <laughs> rebuke the violent. Uh, I don't think that's in the SRD. <laughs> Hellish rebuke, though, is in there. Ah, there we go. Okay, so Hellish rebuke. I could drag this in, and it adds it as a attack. Um, Let's say I'm like, oh, but I want to be an, a warlock, right? That's what that's what gets hellish rebuke. If I drag warlock in, uh, it's going to change my class to warlock. So it's uh, it's important to know. Uh, yeah, I think I think rebuke the violent you you get at level two, but it's um, but it's it's not in the SRD. I think it's in one of the one of the books. Um, healing word is a spell. Um, but yeah, so like Warlock, if, if I drag the class in, then it's going to change my char character class. Uh, just as a warning, when it does that, it might leave your, you know, 
your feature, your class features there. It's supposed to actually overwrite them. But like I said, we're in the middle of changing some of that stuff. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is, yeah, it's a big time saver to drag stuff in. If you have the player's handbook or if your GM has the player's handbook and has shared it with you in uh, compendium sharing, uh, like if they bought it in, in Roll20, then like all of the stuff that's in player's handbook would be available. And um, Roll20 is definitely working to make other books available. Uh, I cannot speak about Xanathar's. Uh, <laughs> I literally cannot tell you like what, if there's even a timeline on that, but um, I can say that like, like uh, Volos has um, class uh, character options, and um, we've we've already announced that we do plan to make those available. It's just right now, um, uh, right now we we just have player's handbook for now. I, I should say, uh, searching for monsters in Volos, yeah, no problem. But like uh, having it available in Character Mancer and be uh, as droppable as as the rest of them is it, it, that's a little trickier. So anyway, so um, so that is kind of the the overview and the quick and dirty on how to set things up in in Roll Twenty. Um, who has who has more questions? I've been I've been really enjoying the question you, you guys have offered so far, and they've been very helpful. I think new GMs will find them uh, useful as well. So. Cool, okay. Uh, well, I think I'm gonna just hang out. <laughs> Let's play a game. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, let me also, uh, so I did this, I, I actually have this set up, um, which is information for logging the event. So uh, today's workshop, <laughs> uh, if you participated in today's workshop, which all of you did, thank you so much for being here, um, is uh, it earns you the Acolyte of Agma DM reward in season seven. So this reward reward is worth 100 gold or 100 XP for one of your characters. Um, my DCI number is right there on screen. Um, and if you don't mind, please put your DCI number in the Twitch chat. Um, if you don't have a DCI number, that's okay. Uh, just um, you know, give me your first name so I can so I can log it, um, and that would be helpful. And if you don't want to use your first name give me your handle that's fine too um but uh yeah because i yes i can i can zoom in i can zoom way in you know what i can also put it in chat um there we go yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, cool. I can actually, it's readable. Um, good, I didn't even transpose numbers. That's great. Um, <laughs> so that's my DCI number for your for your uh, Adventures League log sheet. Um, I don't know if those DM rewards are going to change uh, come Friday because they're going to announce the new DM rewards. Uh, it's possible that they will, in which case future workshops would uh, comply with whatever those rules are. Um, and they might be, you know, they might be a checkpoint. They might be, they might be nothing for all I know, but there you go. Any other questions from anybody? Cool. Cool. Very quiet. Matt's good. Okay. Um, and I think I think most of you came in from uh, Eric's group. Uh, if you did, uh, glad to see you. Um, and uh, if you came from like the newbie GM group or you came from my Facebook, that's cool too. Um, thank you guys for, for participating and for being here. Um, 
Whew. I was a little nervous. This is my first stream, so this is kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> and quality content. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, oh, and, you know, I don't... I didn't really introduce myself or anything, but I'm Stephanie, and uh, I am a DM. I've been DMing for years. Oh, the the sounds thing, the jukebox. Um, Rivex got a question on that one. Okay, let me let me go back over that really quick. Um, so the jukebox. So so say I'm. I'll just use this page because it's fine. So. In Roll20, you click the jukebox icon, and you can add music to your to your jukebox, right? You can add a track. Uh, let's say the bubbling pools, right? Click that, right? And I can play it directly from here, and then everybody will be able to hear it. Um, or I can put it into a uh, into a playlist, like this is a playlist. So it'll play Cave of Time, and then it'll play Bubbling Pools. Um, and it sounds like my audio is really, yeah, my music, you can adjust the ma master music volume level in the gear page. Um, and the other thing that I can do, and it, you know, when it's playing, it'll show, uh, as now playing, um, for players, they will actually see what is playing when it's playing. So like if it's, you know, if, if the name of the, of the sound is something that will give you a spoiler, like. You might want to rename it. <laughs> um, and then, um, and I should point out that there's more than one source available in the jukebox. So we have, um, so we have tabletop audio, which is fantastic. We have battle bards, uh, which is also a terrific source. So there's all kinds of good sources from there as well. Uh, we have uh, Incompetech, um, and they have, they have all kinds of tracks uploaded. And then we have Fanburst, and Fanburst is a little buggy right now. Uh, it just it's been having a little trouble connecting, but Fanburst is pretty cool because in addition to all this content that's there, you can actually upload your own to Fanburst and have it show up in the search results. So if you want to, like you have you have like some creepy speech or something that that you record in advance, you could upload it and then have it uh, and have it served from Fanburst. Um, which is kind of cool, and I'm I'm a little sad that uh, we used to use SoundCloud uh, on Roll Twenty, and SoundCloud uh, disabled. They, they like ended that relationship, um, which is really I, I'm I'm a little sad about that because I have like three files on SoundCloud, and one of them is just me screaming, and it was for a game that somebody was running. So, um, do I use Discord? I sometimes use Discord for my weekly game. I also have been known to use uh, the Roll Twenty built-in chat. Uh, so Roll20 has a, yeah, <laughs> sound can be hit or miss. Um, Roll20 has a WebRTC chat, um, which uh, does work. For me, I keep hitting the video and voice bug. And this is, uh, it's a weird little bug where uh, people will be in, on, you know, in the app. And if somebody doesn't have video broadcasting, then um then it's hit or miss on who will who will connect to them uh or with each other so there's sort of a weird there's a weird bug where uh you have to have like everybody's got to have video broadcasting and it's it's a-okay if you have it set to broadcast video and like you you put tape over your over your thing or you can even um you can set up the the chat avatars to be names only, so you don't even see the video. That's fine. It's just like there's this one weird little quirk with uh, with the Roll Twenty um, uh, voice chat. Uh, but I I didn't I wasn't done with the um, with the audio part, uh, which was that there's a way to set it up so that you're on the page settings. So when your players are dragged to a map it will automatically play on once once it loads like when your players get put onto it it'll automatically play the music or whatever the track is which is kind of cool that's a that was the the trigger of of audio that i was talking about um so yeah using names only yeah i i i get it like not everybody has uh, a nice camera or that not everybody is comfortable on camera i'm a little nervous on camera today too but um 
you know, it is, it is what it is. Uh, sometimes people don't want like their background uh, showing stuff off. Um, you know, it's it's fair. So, in my in my uh, weekly group, we use um, we don't we don't we don't use the the chat at all, <laughs> traitor. Uh, <laughs> but um, we use Discord now, and we used to use Skype. And sometimes when Discord fails us, we go back to Skype uh, because one of our players uh, just has a hard time connecting to anything because he lives out in the mountains and kind of has potato internet. But um, So, yeah, did that answer that question about the jukebox and also about the audio and video? Like there's a little bit of lag between between me and and you guys, so I, I'm sure you've noticed because when you ask a question, I probably don't answer it for like five minutes. But like, why is she ignoring us? Not ignoring you. All right, cool. Um, well, in that case, yeah. Like I said, I'll just hang out here for maybe 15 more minutes. Um, when they move a token to a particular spot. No, not by default. Um, there might be an API that does that. Um, APIs are available for pro users. And I actually don't know, I don't know the ins and outs of APIs, but I do know that that's the kind of thing that, that an API would be able to do. Um, there's a forum for APIs as well uh, in Roll20, which I can call up, in fact. Let's see. Uh, I might not be able to access it with, yeah, I know. I might not be able to access it with a free account though. Oh, I can, okay. So there's a, there's a forum with, um, for, just for API. Um, and let's see, sound, oh, you, okay. Sound trigger, um, API call for a sound trigger, getting sound. Getting sound effects to tr play when certain actions are done. So here's somebody who's looking for some for something that does that, and there's someone who says, "Oh, you can use the role listener." Um, so there's a couple. Uh, Audio master uh, use a, a macro. Doesn't look like it's if you move to a particular spot on the map, but there there might be something if you're especially if you're familiar with writing API stuff like that. You you might you might want to upgrade to Pro and start playing around with that stuff. Yeah, thank you to Zebra Ten. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, there's I mean there's one of the things about Roll Twenty is it it is so feature rich. You know, it, I I've so I've been working here since uh, April and I have been a user since about two weeks after they started accepting users. Um, I was a Kickstarter backer and, uh, oh, using them, not, not writing them. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 don't be, don't be nervous. No, I was, um, I was a Kickstarter backer and I got a beta uh, test invite and I signed up that day. It was actually my wedding anniversary. And I was like, yeah, I don't care. I, I, I need to sign up for this thing because it's so cool. So, um, uh, so I've been a, a user since then and, um, and I've, I've used it like every week since they started. I've, you know, like I said, I've been working here since April. I still, like every week I learn something new. It's, it's pretty cool. It's like, oh yeah, that works like this. Neat. Um, and then of course we always are changing stuff. So that's kind of cool too. Um, some of the APIs, I just, I want to talk about, about APIs cause they're fun. One of the APIs that is available that I really love is called the welcome script. Um, it is such a basic thing. It's, it's, you know how I said, um, that the, the owner of the game, the GM needs to add a character sheet for each player character, right? So I had one I made for Matt's PC and let's say this is for Eric. So I do like Eric's PC. And of course, Eric can come in and he can change it when he's, when he wants to, uh, to change it, you know, he can change the name and everything, right? Well, there's something called a welcome script where the first time somebody joins your game, 
it creates a character sheet for them and welcomes them to the game. And I thought that is like one of the coolest and easiest scripts to, to add. It's just like, it just does one thing really well and I love it. Um, there's, uh, there's a script, uh, Nolan, who's the managing director for Roll20, uh, his favorite script is one that uh, when you drop to half your hit points, uh, it, it, it bloodies you. And, and when you move your token on the board, it leaves little bloody footprints. Uh, which I think is kind of hilarious and pretty funny. So, um, so there's stuff like, like some of the APIs are just are just really cool and, and really slick, um, and uh, and they are they are they are a pro feature, which is why I didn't really uh, delve into them in terms of setting stuff up. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because uh, today I saw a video on YouTube that does exactly that. Um, so you might want to search for that. Uh, what people don't realize is that D&D Beyond is a different company, um, not just from World 20, but also from Wizards. It's actually owned by Twitch. So, <laughs> so uh, a lot of people think, you know, oh, how come I can't use my D&D Beyond purchases on World 20? Uh, and the answer is because, like, D&D Beyond and World 20 don't have, like, they don't have a, a business relationship, you know, directly. So. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so there, there's that, like, that's a, that's one of those things that comes up a lot. And, uh, and, and it, you know, like, like they, that's, it's, I, it, it's, it's a normal confusion because D and D beyond, uh, has done a really good job of branding and licensing, you know, branding their license, uh, for the wizards content. But, um, but it's it's one of those things where it's like people keep asking us, you know, how come I can't use my D and D Beyond character in your in your system? It's like, well, uh, for the same reason you can't use your Overwatch character in, you know, uh, Final Fantasy because they're made by different companies. Um, so, uh, but I did I did see that somebody had written. I think it's a script. I think it's an API script that does that does that. So. Um, is there a way for you to enter all of your characters into the Roll20 platform? Yes. Yes, there is. Um, you can uh, use your use Character Mancer to build them, or you can just, uh, you know, cancel out of Character Mancer and use the uh, character sheet. Um, or do you mean to transfer them from Roll20 uh, to, to Roll20, or for, transfer them from D&D Beyond to Roll20? Because that's what I mentioned before. There's a there's a video that I saw today that, that talks exactly about that, and I think it uses a, an API to do it. Um, ah, so, um, yes, let's talk a little bit about the character vault. So uh, I'm going to exit this game. From paper to roll 20. Yeah, you just hand enter. Yeah. Um, and the way that I would do it is uh, if you're playing with, yeah, if you're playing with, GMs who have a plus account or pro, which um, I believe Eric said that all of the GMs in his in his group should have that by the end of the weekend. Um, so one of the things you can do is uh, let me exit, and I'm going to actually uh, sign out. Uh, ignore that. <clears throat> so. Now I'm logged in as my, as my pro account. This is, uh, this is, I'm, um, oh, no, I'm not. Uh-oh. One moment, please. Uh, standing by, hold on. Um, t -t 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 neat. Oh, good, I can, I can do that. All right. Okay, so um, let me sign out of that. Okay, so I'm coming back. All right, so, uh, and we're back. <laughs> okay, so it's it's not entirely based on the GM. Um, so I'm a GM, obviously, and say I uh, go look at my games. Okay, 
and we'll scroll down to let's say TOA copy. This is a copy of the Tomb of Annihilation. Um, and I go into my game settings and one of my options, and this is as a pro user, so this is not something I have as a, as a free user, okay? But as a pro user, one of the things I can do is I can say, allow players to import their characters. So if I do that, then um, you can, as a, as a free user, if you joined this game, you would be able to go to the character vault and export your character. Um, or import your character into into uh, the game. So here's like my character vault. I can import an existing character from whatever game that I'm in. Uh, this is great. It's got a whole bunch of testing information. And I can also export my character to any game that I want. Um, so the character vault is under tools, right? You've got your compendium. Uh, you've got your mobile app. Don't use those right now. They're they're um, they're they're broken um, for like another week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hope. Um, but it's under tools and it, you just click right there. Uh, now if I am, um, logged in as a free user, I th think I can export, but I can't import. Uh, if I remember correctly, that's how that works. Uh, let me check that. Um, okay, so I can import a character from my game, right? And it's loading because it's not sure that I have a character in that game. Neat. There we go. <clears throat> um, but if I want to export it, uh, I can uh, I can export it to games that I'm the GM of. Uh, oh, shoot. I'm sorry. You're right. There we go. Sorry about that. Here, I'll start over. Okay. So I can import a character. Uh, let's say from Forge of Fury. I'll, I'll import this character. So, um, and you know what? What I can't show you is whether you can do this as a free user with a free free user GM because all of the games that I've joined are uh, owned by a pro account. You know how I said I learn something new every time? Every day? This is today. Uh, <laughs> um, Alright, so let's see. Um, limited vault access, that's me because a uh, free user. Um, I can uh, export characters into a game if it has, uh, if, if I had pro or plus account. So that's default for most games. Um, all access vault can be created by a pro or plus user. Um, and any, any player or GM can export characters into that game. So I can, I can bring my characters in from other games, but I, to export them back out, I, I would need to be, uh, either, um, pro or plus users or games based on marketplaces place modules uh, would be I'd be able to do that as well so um, so yeah thank you rhetoric dogma uh, free user GM um, yeah yeah I'm not entirely sure if you're so if you're free if the GM is a free user I think only pro and plus players can export into the game um, if the uh, yeah, it is, it is easier that way. Um, you can, I mean, so the way that, the way that I would do it is I would make, I would make a, uh, a game, um, on roll 20, you know, I'd make a, you know, just create a game and then, um, make my characters in that game as, as a GM and then export them to the character vault or import them into the character vault. And then I would look for games that have all access vault as a, as an option. So. Um, and, or, you know, I don't know, have two screens open and, and copy the information if I needed to. But like I said, I think in Eric's group, a lot of GMs have, have a, a, pl a plus or pro subscription because there's so many tools that are available for GMs for that. Um, and a lot of players stay at the free level and that's perfectly acceptable. It's, um, 
uh, we got a we got a question a couple weeks ago from somebody who, just, who flat out said, you know, most of the most of the features for Pro are really geared towards GMs. Uh, I'm a I'm a player. I don't need all of that stuff. Uh, how can I support Roll Twenty? And you know, our our take on that is, well, you can always buy your GM a gift. Uh, that's always nice. Um, but we are so happy to have fans, and we're so happy to have players. You know, it's it's that it's it it is what it is. Like if you if you don't um, if you don't need those tools, then you know there's lots of other ways to support. So. Uh, and one of them is just simply to be a fan and tell people about the game and tell people about Roll20. Like, we're like, yeah, like, just be enthusiastic about the platform and that's gift enough. So, uh, anyway, that's, uh, I think that's that's kind of a wrap. Um, <laughs> to, if anybody has any future questions or anything, feel free to um, uh, uh, hit us up on Facebook um, because I know that... Uh, um, you know, uh, post in the, in Eric's group, or, um, if you are friends with me on, on Facebook, like Matt is, uh, you can certainly hit me up there. Um, otherwise, thanks so much for being here and, um, uh, for your time and your, and your energy and all of your questions. They were terrific questions. So, uh, have a great, uh, Wednesday evening. And I'm going to stop streaming.